Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Home Tech. I'm Seth Johnson, and this week, not joined by Jason Griffin. Jason's actually uh, under the weather a little bit today, and uh, hopefully we'll get him back on the show next week. Um, today, we've got a really good interview with Josh Christian of the Home Technology Association. Uh, you may have seen that name float by there around Cedia time, I think is when they they kind of launched, uh, either right at Cedia or right before Cedia. Uh, we caught up with Josh at Cedia uh, while we were there, uh, had a good conversation with him, and uh, now we said we've got to get you on the show to talk about what you're doing. Uh, they've got a really cool certification process that they are um, they're offering for uh, integrators uh, to get in and actually um, get a, get a certification uh, out there in the marketplace that actually means something. Uh, so when you see a HCA certified uh, dealer or dealership, uh, you know that they have uh, met some standards, uh, which in this industry is kind of hard to come by. So very cool interview. I'll let the interview stand. And, uh, Josh speak for himself on all this stuff. It's a very interesting association, what they're trying to do. And uh, it's getting a lot of support here in the industry. So definitely check that out. Uh, always want to thank our patrons for supporting the show. That's that's how we keep things going. That's how we how we pay the bills for the website and all that good stuff. Uh, so definitely want to reach out and thank everybody uh, for supporting the show over at our Patreon. Uh, that's over at hometech.fm slash support. Uh, you can read about how to support the show, how to help us out each week for as little as $1 a month. Uh, we definitely want to thank everybody who's done that uh, and everybody who is over at the Hub, which is our private Slack channel. Uh, at the dollar a month membership level, you get access to that. There's a lot of good conversation that goes on in there uh, every day. So uh, without further ado, let's get started with the uh, show. We've got a couple of news stories I did want to touch on, even without Jason here, because uh, I think they're kind of important, and I think we all want to talk about them. But first, we want to talk about the pick of the week, and this actually came from the Hub. Uh, one of our uh, patrons, TJ Huddleston, uh, has moved to Ohio. And while he was there, he went to the early television museum in Columbus and uh, was taking some pictures and posting them in the hub over the weekend. And uh, one of these TV sets actually just stood out to me and said, wow, that's, that's probably one of the craziest TVs I've ever seen. So I'm going to put it here in the show notes. Uh, also a link, TJ actually did this uh, massive uh, Google photo album. Uh, that you can go through and kind of kind of look at all the TVs that he saw. These are all early TVs. So we're talking from like the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, but the one that really stood out to me was uh, the one I'll put a link to in the show note. It's called the uh, the Cuba Comet. And that's spelled with K's. K-U-B-A and Comet is K-O-M-E-T. Uh, it's a TV from uh, 1957 to 1962 uh, built in West Germany. And that kind of explains the K's. Uh, it stands five foot seven tall, weigh, weighs over 300 pounds or about 300 pounds and is over seven foot wide. Uh, it's got a TV, of course. It's got a little compartments in it, sometimes used for a bar. Uh, you could get this thing with a four speed telefunken phonograph built into it, AM, FM radio. Uh, this this was the console TV. Oh, oh, and, and, and when you go look at this, you'll you'll realize this thing looks like a sailboat, right? So it's it's got this massive uh, <laughs> appendage on the top of it. Uh, look at this. The sail the sail has eight speakers inside of it. Six of them on the top and two horn speakers pointing forward, located beneath the main console. Uh, this 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 was the audio video system of the 1950s and 60s. I, I got to say, hands down, this is probably one of the coolest looking TVs I have ever seen. Uh, it cost uh, at the time approximately one thousand two hundred sixty dollars, which today uh, represents more than, or at the time, represent more than a wages for an average worker. So, very expensive TV set, but uh, definitely go check this out, and also check out all the other TV sets that uh, that and projectors. Uh, that TJ posted there on his uh, Google photo share. Uh, I thought it was really cool. And uh, thanks to TJ for sharing. Uh, the, I, if I ever make it up to Columbus, I'm definitely going to have to stop by and take a look at some of this stuff. Uh, looks like an amazing, amazing museum. I want to also thank uh, Kevin Morgan for kind of sending in a, uh, a video for me to watch. Uh, this is over at Lazy Game Reviews. And I'm um, not going to go dive too deep into this, but uh, what they do over there is they kind of review old games and, and old hardware, old computer hardware. Uh, but this week uh, they reviewed the X10 RS232 controller uh, with a with a light switch. Um, <laughs> it's actually kind of a funny video because he has an LED plugged into it, and of course uh, it starts flickering uh, when he puts an incandescent bulb, and in, it works fine. But 
one of the other pieces of software that he tested was the HAL 2000 voice control um, software, which uh, was around in the late 90s, I want to say. I do remember actually having to set this up in somebody's house who was disabled. Uh, it is a very interesting software. It does not work the way you think it does. But um, for somebody who is disabled, uh, it, it's a, I mean, it's, it's, a way, it's a way to live their life a little bit better. So uh, if you've never seen those two things, the X10R's 232 controller for the computer <laughs> from the 80s and uh, HAL 2000 voice controller to, to kind of see what uh, this stuff looked like early on, go check this video out. I'll put a link to it in the show notes, which will be over at hometech.fm slash 185. So moving on, the first uh, big news story we had this week, uh, Honeywell. A, uh, a security company that has been around selling uh, products into the professional market, pro professional and enterprise market uh, for a long time, has announced their first DIY security system uh, with uh, Amazon Alexa integration. Uh, now, this is, uh, it's called, they're calling this the Honeywell Smart Home Security System, which is a, kind of a great name, I guess. Uh, it is, it's built around an all-in-one uh, base station hub. So we're going to have to ring the bell on this. Uh, and it looks similar to an Amazon Echo, but I think it's about the size of uh, Canary. So it's a little bit smaller from what the videos and pictures that I saw were showing. The system has its own sensors for windows and doors, motion detection, and also offers key fobs for arming and disarming the alarm. Uh, they say that there's integration with Amazon Alexa, but uh, HomeKit, Google Assistant, and If This Then That, uh, and a, a facial recognition feature are all coming later on, they're saying. Uh, they launched on Indiegogo, which is kind of pointless for a billion-dollar company like Honeywell, but um, I'm just going to call it what it is. Uh, this is a pre-ordering mechanism for a company that really doesn't have any retail outlets uh, to normal, everyday customers. They're, they're typically sold, Honey, Honeywell gear is typically sold behind distribution. Uh, which is blocked off to most people who aren't a uh, security company. So I, I guess to me, this seems like this is the only way that they're actually going to be able to take this product to market. Um, they're saying they're using it to get feedback from customers early on and work on the features that are more popular. But to me, this looks like, hey, this is a way we can we can sell this uh, $400 hub uh, to customers. Now, uh, the, they, the sensors that I mentioned above, they range from $30 to $50. And right now you can pre-order the hub and a couple of those sensors. Um, the hub alone, if you just were to pre-order that, it's $245, which is about a 40% discount. But uh, they have some other packages there. If you're, if you're interested, I'll put a link in the show notes to the Indiegogo page where um, you can get it. Looks like an overall interesting system. Honeywell's a big name. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, this is a product that's just, it's not going to get bought out. Uh, you don't have to worry about it going away. So if, they're do, if they do end up doing all they say that this thing will go, is going to do, I think it'll be a pretty good system in the end. Another big news comes from TiVo this week. Uh, they launched a new, uh, three new products, actually. Uh, TiVo Vox, the TiVo Mini Vox, and the Vox Remote. Uh, the TiVo Vox lineup allows users to use their remote, the Vox Remote, uh, to search for content with their voice. Uh, and they can search across live TV recordings, video on demand, and online streaming services. So uh, this is similar to what we've seen from, come from companies like uh, Comcast. They have the X1 system where you can yell into your remote and it will search across all of those services that I just listed um, with the Comcast box. This, so this is, this is TiVo's competitor using TiVo's interface uh, and uh, TiVo's boxes. So a little bit better. Uh, the Vox, the TiVo Vox, it's V-O-X I'm saying, uh, starts at $200 for the half a terabyte, $300 for the terabyte. Uh, both of those come with four tuners, um, or it has a um, three terabyte model for it with six tuners. Unfortunately, that three terabyte model is cable card only. It doesn't do ATSC tuning, so you can't use it for over the air. You'll have to use either the 500 or one 500 gigabyte or one terabyte models for that. Um, prices, of course, don't include the TiVo service, which runs about $15 a month, and you can pay annually or for the lifetime of the device on their website. Uh, overall, I like this. If I were not so much of the cord cutter that I am today, I would probably buy this thing because this looks amazing. <laughs> this is exactly what I want from a professional product. Uh, everything is all in one spot. Like you don't have to go looking for uh, movies on Netflix and trying to figure out what's on Hulu versus what's on TV uh, versus what's on HBO. Like everything is there and you can use your voice to search for it. Um, this is an example of what TV should be. Uh, I just don't know how much, 
I don't know how much TiVo has in it, you know, has in them left to do this stuff anymore uh, because you're seeing devices like uh, the Amazon Fire TV or the Apple TV or, you know, even Roku doing similar things, right? So I, I'm not sure how much longer you're going to get away with selling a uh, $200 or two to $300 device um, to compete w- with that cost $15 a month to compete with something like, you know, the Apple TV with the channels app. I mean, that's the Apple TV is 150. The channels app is 25. If I get a hard drive and hook it up, I, I think it was $8 a month for the DVR service that they were offering. So, I mean, you can definitely do this less, but TiVo typically has done such a great job uh, at putting all the stuff together, making it all work where you pick up the remote and you actually push a button and you're watching TV. Um, I can't quite say the same for the Apple TV, although it has been pretty reliable. Uh, sometimes, you know, you have to get in there and reboot the box. TiVo never really had that problem. I got to say they, they stuck with the same stupid angled box design as the TiVo, the old TiVo bolt. However, on the plus side, this thing comes in black and not white, which, uh, which will look great. And they're in with all the other black devices that you have in your media center and not stand out like a sore thumb, uh, like the old Bolt did. So good on TiVo for, my, for getting this out. And also, they announced their uh, Hydra um, interface was coming out soon. Uh, on Sunday, they announced that the uh, highly anticipated interface would be available. Uh, if you're a TiVo customer, you can go to the website and fast track the optional update by requesting the update for the devices on your account. Um, the viewers are saying, and I'll put a link to Dave Zatz article, which he was kind of the first person I saw downloading this thing and installing it. Uh, they say in the interface and some of the features are incomplete and it's kind of a work in progress. Uh, TiVo, the live guide is gone, which is, it was a very interesting guide that TiVo offered. I didn't, can't say that I used it much, but it, it basically had the channels on the left side. And when you selected a channel on the right side, it told you exactly what was on TV for, you know, if it was six o'clock in the afternoon, you could see the six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine, 10, all, all that was listed down on the right hand side. Um, pretty cool guide. I thought it was nice, but I never actually use it. Uh, in this case, uh, TiVo has dumped that in favor of the traditional grid guide that you see on every other cable box. Uh, so kind of sad to see the feature go, but, um, you know, can't say that I was ever a fan or used it that much. Some of the bugs, there's some bugs still in the software right now. So if you go out and install it on your TiVo boxes, it might not work as well as you're hoping. <laughs> like the back button, I guess the, the left arrow button is missing or not working on some of the TiVo minis when they're updated. Um, so there's some bugs that definitely need some ironing out. Um, hopefully this, uh, this interface will come out shortly after all these bugs get, uh, worked out. Uh, but I will put a link to, um, to a, a, a video, I think also posted by Dave Zatz, uh, from TiVo explaining the, uh, interface. So you can kind of take a look at the new Hydra interface looks like, looks pretty slick. And if I had a TiVo, I would definitely be all over this because, um, it, it's kind of their next generation all HD interface. So very exciting to see. Uh, good for TiVo for kind of keeping up with things. Um, but like I said, hopefully that they will, uh, hopefully it'll look pretty good and, and stay in business. Um, if I ever come back around to actually turning my cable back on, not likely, uh, I definitely would be ordering a new TiVo to make that happen. So that's all for the news this week. Let's go ahead and jump into the interview with Josh Christian from the Home Technology Association. Like I said at the top of the show, they are out to help certify the uh, integrators in this community uh, with a rigorous test and uh, of the of the business and and practices that they they put out. Uh, So let's go ahead and dive into the interview with Josh Christian of the Home Technology Association. Hi, Josh. Uh, Welcome to Home Tech. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm happy to be here. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you on. Um, we're really excited about HTA and and really excited to get the information out there um, for people to know at. But before we start, we always like to get kind of a uh, a general uh, personal intro from our guests and some of their background. So uh, and and how that leads them into into doing what they're doing today. Uh, so I guess uh, where 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 did you start out here in the industry and, and how did that get you uh, to to HTA here at the end. All right. Well, yeah. Thanks for asking. So, yeah, I've been uh, been in the industry in the home technology industry since 1995, and uh, I started in the industry at a a store in, out in Thousand Oaks, uh, uh, Wilshire Media Systems, which is still doing very well. Um, and at the time, it was a, a an audio video kind of a more of a retail presence. And but in 1998, I moved over to a company. Uh, DSI Entertainment Systems, and that was based in Los Angeles. That was strictly custom only, and, and that's where I really got hands-on into, you know, smart home, or as we used to call it, 
home automation systems. Um, really got involved at that, and it was a great ride because got to be there at a, at the time when the company was small, and we grew in size and complexity to be one of the largest uh, integrators in Southern California and even in the U- U.S. A, a top 100 CE Pro company for many years. So I was involved in the sales and marketing side of of both companies and enjoyed it very much. I was very active with architects, designers, and builders, you know, going and doing outreach and uh, doing lunch and learns, letting these industry partners know about all the different technology options that were available to them and how to integrate them into the home's design and architecture. So I'm very active with that. Matter of fact, I used to teach at CEDIA Expo for about four four or five years. I taught a class on how to work with interior designers. So I was very much out in the public face, trying to be an ambassador, I guess you could say, of the technology industry to the design and build professionals and did that all the way through 2015. And in 2015, I moved over to uh, the consultant side of the industry. So a a low voltage consultant, we didn't sell product or install it, but we did all the design and engineering and those design and engineering documents would go out to bid amongst uh, integrators. And, but I was still out there again, working with architects, designers, and builders. So how this kind of morphed into Home Technology Association is during my time in sales and marketing and especially working for a really, really good company, and we were qualified to do very large projects. And what would happen, and this seems to be a problem that happens all throughout the world, not even just only the U.S., is that you have a good, solid integration firms that are been in business for years that have a proven history, a proven track record of doing a great job at a certain size and scale of project, yet they would lose these projects to lesser qualified firms, you know, companies that uh, were just way outside of their wheelhouse, um, or worse yet, maybe even a company you knew about, but had really poor customer service and left clients wanting more. And it was very frustrating to lose projects to lesser qualified firms. And You know, even very, very smart, wealthy people that are obviously intelligent people to be where they are in their life were making really bad decisions on what company to hire. And so what the real what created the HTA, the Home Technology Association, is realization is that, hey, what this industry lacks is some kind of outside organization that vets and verifies and gives some kind of seal of approval on a technology company. No one's created that standard. What does a good company look like? So that was the that was the reason behind it, and said so let's let's create an association, let's create a standard, let's define what good looks like, and make a standard that uh, will recognize the, the the firms out there that are doing a great job with technology and making consumers happy with technology and want and leaving them wanting more in their next home instead of the opposite. How many times have you heard? Uh, and this is another big problem in the industry. You got too many takeover projects happening from companies that just ruin it. Or the other problem too is, you know, maybe a, a builder you like refers you to a project and you meet this the potential new client and they want less technology in their new home because the last integrator screwed it up so bad. And, you know, this, this happens over and over and over and over, right? So it's got to stop. And the other problem, yeah, the other problem too, the manufacturers feel it, right? So uh, the control system manufacturers, lighting control uh, manufacturers, you know, as you know, and we all know in the industry, uh, a good smart home system, a good lighting control system done well, implemented well by a good integrator is magic. Clients love it. But if you screw it up, right, they hate it. I can't tell you how, how many times I heard, I'm never having another X system because the last one I had in my house up north never worked. And we always had, and, and of course, I'm selling X, you know, the right. product or whatever. And yep. I know that it works fine. But I, I know since they said that, that it was never installed correctly. Exactly. That happened. And what you just said has happened to me many, many, many times, even where the architects would even know brand X and say, don't you mention brand X around here? Because if you do, do you sell something besides brand X? Because if you mention that, they'll throw you out of the house. Right. And, you know, that's sad. You know, the fact that manufacturers, um, you know, a great product would get a bad name. So, you know, these are problems that, you know, we all know and kind of commiserate over. 
But this is something that the Home Technology Association is designed to stop. So yeah, create a standard, which was not easy to do. It was a, quite a challenge. But to create a standard of what does good look like, and let's put some teeth to it. Let's put a, a, a real application process and a vetting process to it. Um, it was done. It's not me. You know, I, I run the company, but I, I didn't. It's not my standard that I'm foisting on the world. This was a collaboration of many different professionals, um, integrators that um, that I've known. And but very importantly, we have a really good board of advisors, which could be seen on our our website. At if you go to the WHO link on there, you'll see that there's nine really big names in our industry that came together. You know, even from the leading leading companies that even compete very fiercely with one another. You know, Crestron, Savant, Control Four, Lutron. You know, got you know VPs and executives from all four of those companies and more that came together to help craft the standard because they all. Everyone said, why didn't someone do this before? This is great. How can we help? So that's kind of what came about, came up upon it. And so, you know, this is one of those things where every, all the good integrators will win because now they have a certification that means something that, that's defensible, that will, you send a client to the website and say, this is what I, this is the certification standard I met. It means something. It's like, a GIA certified diamond, you know, or a ASE certified mechanic, like you were mentioning earlier, you know, some kind of outside vetting organization that uh, will give client confidence that, hey, this company knows what they're doing, and not only knows what they're doing in a professional, but we even go a little further um, and to to show what size projects and complexity of projects an integrator is going to be best at, because we, we show a lot of uh, company specifications on our dealer locator. So it's really designed to serve the consumer, make sure they're happy with their technology, and give architects, designers, and builders a, a, a filter, if you will. Our website's a kind of a clearinghouse to find the best firms out there, and they could use it as a tool to weed out you know, the plethora of companies out there that seem to grow on trees that really have no business being in a larger project because it's just too, too many projects out there go sideways. Right. We've got to stop that. And your goal with HCA uh, or the HCA's goal is to create this this certification. And 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 we we talked about a little bit about that in in kind of uh, our pre previous uh, conversation about the ASE, which is I see that when I bring my car to the mechanic, I see that they are wearing the little shirts with the ASE stamp on the shoulder, and they may have a placard up on the wall that said they're an ASE shop. I have no idea what it means, but like you said, it it instills confidence in me that, that they have gone through some kind of certification uh, to prove that they, they actually know what they're doing when they stick their head underneath my car and start poking around in there and, and, and that my car will actually crank up and drive off their lot uh, when they're done messing around. Um, and, and that's, that's a great, <laughs> that's a great thing to have that confidence, uh, you, you know, to, to make sure that uh, there's at least some, some credentials behind uh, the people that you're hiring to do um do the work in this house and so, some of these homes, I mean, we're, we're talking about stuff that, that costs as much as a car, if not more, you know, this, this is, this is uh, a, these can be very expensive systems and systems that take a lot of design and, and a lot of labor and effort that goes into them. Uh, th these things, these systems can get way up there. And if uh, a company is not exactly. qualified, uh, you know, we were joking earlier, we call them truck slammers in this industry, uh, here in the States, we call them truck slammers. I think they're, there's something else overseas. Boot slammers um, in England, right? Boot slammers, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it, it, it's, you know, I, and I've been there, I've been with a smaller company. Um, by no means do I think that we were, we were unqualified to do things, but, um, we, we definitely walked into projects that were probably over our head for our company size. Um, and, and if if there was a, a, a vetting process, uh, it, the the job definitely would have gone somewhere else, and we wouldn't have been involved with it so heavily. Um, and and some of those jobs can can not only put a strain on on the uh, on the owner of the uh, owner of the technology in the house, uh, it puts a stress on on the company. And, and right. I've seen a lot of companies take these massive jobs, and it it just buries them, and yep. they don't know what to do, and they go out of business. Exactly. Yeah, they could get sued out of existence from you know a wealthy homeowner that gets upset. And you know, I agree with you too, Seth. And, and my background when I, I first got into the custom world, we we were a small firm, kind of looking for our path at the time. We weren't sure if we were going to be a production home builder focused company or doing real high end. We were kind of without a rudder for a little bit. 
But once we decided to to kind of dig in on the higher end home automation systems, there was a learning curve. And you're right, we wouldn't have met back then too, because uh, fortunately we got to experiment on some wealthy friends, you know, that cut us some slack. You know, right. say, hey, yep, you're yep. kind of my <laughs> guinea pig on the on this whole thing. <laughs> so kind of got a little lucky there. But, um, you know, oftentimes you don't have that experience and you're guinea pigging on a client that could sue you out of existence. And uh, yeah, so that's a very real thing. And, and, and not only and here's the other thing that that's really neat about the Home Technology Association, not only is there a standard set to recognize the firms that are already good and doing a great job, but it's also kind of aspirational. So um, looking back at the company, you know, we were back in 1998. If there was such a thing as the HTA back then, we would have kind of had a standard to aim for and shoot right, for, right. and that would have helped that company grow quicker, better without bumping into walls for a few years to try to figure it out. You know, it's kind of almost like a, a mentor. So, yeah, we're hoping to to elevate the industry too, to give firms that are up and coming um, kind of a way forward, a, a way. Here's kind of best practices, and it's kind of inferred pretty easily by looking at the company profiles that are on our site now, um, what are some of the things you should be looking at? And, and, and we've, we've kind of touched on this briefly, but you know, there, there is cert, there is a, a certification based around, uh, HCA that a company can go get, uh, there, it looks like you have three different levels, foundation, luxury, and estate. Um, but briefly let's, let's just touch on a couple of, uh, you know, high level bullet points that, that, uh, that you think are important. I mean, you can go look at these on the website and we'll definitely put links in the show notes to, for people to go check this out. Um, touch on a couple of uh, the, the high level bullet points that you think are important for the certification. Sure. So first of all, um, most of the certification re- requirements amongst the three tiers are, are similar. And so just so everybody has an idea of what we're overall looking for, there's three basic pillars of, of what we look for. And that is number one, technical ability. Number two, what are the customer service and aftercare support policies of that company? Too bad Jason's not on the phone, you know, because this falls right into what he does at One Vision, you know, very much into aftercare and customer service, but that's a big part of this. And number three is the reputation in the marketplace. So again, with that board of advisors and months of going back and figuring this out, if we have a way of of scoring and getting an intel on that, but those are the three overall tiers of what it takes for a company to be certified. Plus things like you must be in business for a minimum of three plus years. Um, they have to be able to be endorsed by industry peers and industry partners like architects, designers, and builders, and uh, you know not have serious legal issues or liens. If if you're low. Your municipality requires a license. You have to have that. We do check insurances, workers' comp, liability. Um, they must do uh, background checks on employees and and also have to deliver enterprise-grade networks on your projects. You know, we all know this in the industry, right? Um, the network is the backbone of the home, and, you know, that is a minimum spec. You have to be doing enterprise-grade networks on your, on your projects. So those are kind of like the high-level, basic, the basic certification requirements. And then um, there are three different, like you mentioned them, there's three different tiers, foundation, luxury, and estate. Now these aren't black and white hard boundaries between these, but what the idea is, and this is something that you know us in the industry will know, but consumers don't, is that we're not all the same. There, there are integration firms could be excellent, um, companies that do smaller level projects, less complex, you know, projects that take maybe days or weeks to complete, but not years. Um, you know, not real big, uh, complex, whole home, smart home systems. Um, you got firms that do a great job of that. It's a very profitable model for many, many companies. Um, and they're typically working on homes smaller. And I say typically, because again, this is not a black or white thing, but let's say, you know, homes 5,000 square feet and less, if I had to just pick a number. And then you get into the little more complex homes, you know, where you're doing more smart home, larger homes, maybe five to 10,000 square feet. Um, now you, you know, the client, th- these are, you know, higher end homes and the, the budgets go up maybe 50 K to a quarter million, you know, that's the overall budget of the technology in the home. Th- those type of companies are different, right? You n- need to have project management. You need to have, you know, skilled programmers on staff, or at least work with third party skilled programmers. Um, you have to be able to do engineering documents, uh, that you have to be able to provide those. 
so you know that that's some of the differences we we look a little more intensely on on engineering capabilities and do a little uh, background to see if they've done projects in this size and have they done a good job at it and the estate level is the the there's not a huge difference really between the luxury and estate they're not saying they're, they're radically different companies but the estate what the difference there is these are companies that have a a demonstrated history of doing projects in the quarter million dollar plus range. And these would be in typically maybe even higher end homes, but, but that's kind of the, the basics of those three different certifications. So they're all good companies. They might specialize in different um, project sizes overall and complexity of projects. So that that's the, the ideal. And the site will, on a high level way, explain this to a client that, Hey, they're not all created equal. And you kind of have to right size the company with, with your project and your particular needs. Right. Yeah, when I, when I first started out in this industry years ago, uh, I, I looked at the dollar range of the projects we were doing and, you know, always aspired. I, I can't wait till we start doing these uh, quarter of a million dollar projects. Uh, you know, every project should be a quarter million dollar project. And uh, as a, as I grew and learned, um, I, I quickly learned that no, 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 no. You can have a great company uh, doing five and ten thousand dollar installs left and right. Yeah. Um. And and you you can you can you can really make you can make a lot of money doing that. I yeah. Mean, there's there's so true. many more of those jobs out there than there are the the quarter million plus uh, jobs. And but at the same time, when I did run across uh, here in my market, we didn't get that high very often. Um. But when I did run run across those. I quickly realized uh, being involved with them that they were way out of what the company was structured to handle. Right. Um, the, 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 uh, one of the things you talked about was aftercare. I mean, e even the aftercare, uh, which is, which is service calls. I mean, it, this is, this is something that you have to really design your entire company around to handle. And, uh, the companies that I was involved with really weren't ready to, uh, step up their service and, you know, send a truck, uh, an hour South, uh, to take care of somebody's cable modem that locked up, you know, for the third time. Yep. Uh, because at the time we had everybody on a pre-wire <laughs> right. 20 miles north yep. and we just couldn't do that. So yeah, I, I, I quickly learned that every one of these, uh, every one of these categories you have listed here, uh, it, I, I can see quickly, or I can see pretty easily that you're going for what you said, the excellence in these companies. Like it really doesn't, it doesn't matter which one of these you have, as long as you have one, I suppose uh, that you're you're going to get a good company that that's that's got that's meeting these expectations that you guys are putting up. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna end up with a pretty good company. Right. Yep. That's that's the whole idea. Give the clients a company that's gonna to do a, a great uh, job deploying the systems of their needs. And uh, what's I don't think we talked about it on on this side yet. On um, was the budget calculator. This is something that's a very useful tool. We built the first consumer-facing budget calculator tool on our website. It's kind of front and center there. And because clients have usually no clue what technology systems even cost, right? This is, you know, you've been doing this for a while. The clients are often get sticker shock when they find out what these things can add up to, but, you know, of course, depending on their needs. And often it's the integrator, the one being the bearer of the bad news, right? When they give them a proposal and kind of knocks their socks off. But the budget calculator on the site's designed to very, very high level, kind of a 30,000 foot view, give a client an idea of what their budget range could be. And that does two things. First of all, kind of gives them that sticker shock now, you know, from a, us, a, a third party dot org company, not trying to sell them anything. So they tend to take what we tell them as fact, but it also helps them now understand that, you know, if your budget range is between X and Y, that companies of this certification level are, are um, best qualified to handle a project of, 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 you, of this particular complexity. And that really kind of comes more into play on the really, really big system. So you'll see that the advice to the consumer will tell them, hey, you know, HTA certified firms at the luxury and estate level would be the best fit. So going back like what you said, Seth, and, and going back to my prior experience, when we were doing small systems and the budget range is, let's say, quarter million to $330,000 on the budget calculator. Was I the company that you'd want to hire? No, <laughs> we didn't have experience deploying at that. And we don't want a client hiring a company where that's not their wheelhouse because they, they're, odds are they're going to fail or give a client a subpar experience 
But that same firm would knock it out of the park on a smaller system. So let's just make sure the right, the right qualified company or the right size company gets that project. So that's another way to kind of serve the consumer and make sure that they get a, um, a good technology experience. Yeah. I just, I just ran like a generic house, uh, through this, uh, through your budget calculator. And man, I, I got to say it's spot on. <laughs> it's, uh, no, thanks. It's, yeah. it, it's pretty good. I, I wish I had a, had this when I was selling because I would have gone to it every time <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just to have a low and a high, uh, you know, every time I had a client, they were asking, you know, how much do you think this is going to cost? And, and these simple questions that you have here on the website, um, a couple of clicks later, uh, as you were talking about it, I was able to add up and figure out, you know, this hypothetical house that I have is going to be between forty-four thousand and seventy-five thousand dollars. Um, and that that that's exactly what I was kind of, you know, adding up and expecting in my ha- in my head. There you go. That may sound a little high to some of our our listeners, but if you're getting everything done, you know, soup to nuts, this is this is kind of what you can expect. And it, it, this is just a budget range. Like this is this is where the conversation can start. Exactly. And, and and you move on cutting and and figuring out how to budget engineer uh, things from there. Exactly. It's that starting point. It's that conversation. Exactly. And and I'm glad it, you, you were doing that. Um, it only took what two three minutes. It's a very simple budget calculator. Um, it's getting great feedback from integrators and and architects, builders, and designers. They love it. It's a great tool. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, no, this is, this is excellent. I'm glad, I'm glad somebody's supplying this. Cause I, like I said, I was looking for something like this for years. Um, you, you talked a little, we, we, we touched on it and, and you, you, you know, you tease Jason, uh, 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 this is kind of his forte and what he's doing, but, uh, let's talk a little bit about the importance of aftercare in the HCA certification. What, what do you expect? What, what requirement are you expecting out of that? Yeah, what we are expecting, you know, first does a company even a have a customer service policy. <laughs> right, it kind of that, right. that sounds almost comical, but um, you know, as, as you might know, and we know, been in the industry for a while, there are some companies that it's kind of an afterthought. They're all on to the next project, and they don't seem to really focus on that. And I could tell you, in my experience, you know, 16 years being an integrator out there in the trenches, how many takeover projects we did. And by the way, it wasn't because of the. the and sometimes it was because a you know a, a company botched the installation from the get-go, but many times it was the company just became irres- uh, unresponsive to uh, service calls. You know things need to be yep. updated. You know got a new you know back in the day you know I got a new DVD player or Blu-ray player and um, I need to get my remote control program to fix it. Yeah, I'll be out there in two weeks. You know and and that that wasn't going to cut it. So. Um, yeah, we do look at things like that. There's there's a bunch of questions, and by the way, the whole the whole way that dealers apply for certifications through an online application process. So, in the application, um, there are a lot of questions we ask, um, and and there's no such thing as a perfect score. I mean, there's no company I think alive that's going to answer yes or positive to every question. But we ask things like, you know, do you have, <laughs> do you have, you know, what's your warranty policy? Do you, what you know, what is it? Stated. We we show that by the way on the dealer profiles on the site. You know what what type of warranty do they offer? Do they offer extended warranties? Do they have 24 hour on on site service? Do they have 24 hour phone support? You know that's something obviously One Vision does. 24 hour one support could even be had by really most integrators now, right? With companies like like Jason's or One Vision and others now that are popping up like that. So um, yeah, and how many days typically does it take to uh, turn around a service call, um, you know, non-emergency service call. We ask a lot of details. Do you guarantee those times? Um, do what was another one that we ask that we offer? Um, no, that I don't have the application in front of me. But there's quite a few questions we ask. Oh, here's one thing I was going to tell you. We test. So if someone says they have 24-hour phone support, we'll actually test that out. <laughs> we call <laughs> Excellent. at crazy hours <laughs> just to test it. Yeah, we, you know, because it's easy just to go there and fake some things, right? But um, I got to say, if, if an integrator comes in there and they see the questions, and we don't tip our hand to say, like, oh, you must have these. And, you know, there is a scoring system that we use that's, you know, proprietary. But they could kind of tell, oh, I better take this seriously, um, you know, this whole service thing. And I've actually had some integrators say, hey, I'm going to in- institute 24 hour. Um, phone support soon. Should I wait on my application? Is that going to help my score? <laughs> you know, I don't say, yeah, it's going to definitely help your score. I'm not going to tell you how much, but yeah, it's going to help. 
but why do we care about this? Because it serves the customer, right? It's all about making the customer happy. And that is important. And there's even a question on there, for example, like, do you, do you list your service policy on your website? And, and it's interesting to see that some companies do and, you know, do you have a website. <laughs> I mean, <that's, laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Right. A, do you have a website B? Yeah. But, um, you know, if they do, then that shows that that company actually really cares about customer service. It doesn't say they have to have 24 hour service. It does, that's not the point, but do they have a stated policy that their clients can know and accept if they, if they, uh, you know, what, what, is, what is the client's expectations? Do they know what they're getting? Is that defined to them? Do they, do they, do they have a contract that explains to the client what, what type of service that they're going to offer? Those are things that, that matter to us. And that's something that an integrator could do. You mean stop right there in the middle of the application and say, hmm, maybe I need to button things up a little bit. Um, and if so, then, and, and they decide to up their game a little bit, hey, right, we all right. win, right? right? The whole industry wins. So that's right. important. So are there any costs associated with becoming certified? Uh, is it a lifetime deal or is there like renewal and continuing education? Is, what, what's required uh, cost-wise uh, to become certified with HTA? So there is a cost. There is a certification fee that is $400. So there's an application, again, filled out online. And it's, it's, it's a big application. It's pretty lengthy. And... Um, and just so if any integrators are listening and wondering more about it, you could kind of save an exit and come back to it. It's not like you have to fill it out in one, one session. Um, it may, may take a couple of days. <laughs> yeah. It might take a couple of days to come back and think about things and, you know, pull up some of the, the math that we're asking about and project sizes and things. But um, at the end of that application, we do a preliminary sweep to make sure that it's going to at least meet the high level uh, certification standards um, you know, if, if there's some glaring problems there and, and they, we could tell they're not going to qualify, we're not going to charge anybody anything. But if, if they make it through that preliminary spec, it's typically a, a $400 application fee. And then once we go through the whole vetting process, and that takes some time because we do check these things. This isn't a, a pay to play thing at all. We do vet and verify and check endorsements and do a, a lot of checking about the integrator. Um, assuming they're certified, then there is an ongoing fee. It, they could either do it monthly. It could be as low as $150 a month, if, you know, paying by ACH or, or $1,500 a year, which is basically two months free. Slightly teeny bit higher with credit card fees, but I mean, it's basically let's just say $150 a month or $1,500 a year. And uh, the company does have to recertify annually. There's no additional fees. Like there's not there's not another four hundred dollar recertification fee that's we we eat those additional vetting fees. But the idea is that um, a company has to stick with that um, the standards. So we we recheck and um, for a couple of things to make sure that the company is still doing a solid job in their market. And number two, we're gonna it, it's kind of a, a reminder point to check in with them and see you know look at their project size mix and maybe. Maybe that company's evolving and they're doing bigger projects now. Maybe they, they fit into a different certification tier. Um, so that's another reason why we check in. And of course, brands. We list all the brands that a manufacturer wants to list, or excuse me, that the integrator wants to list that they sell. And maybe their brand uh, mix has changed up. And, you know, I don't sell this brand, but I sell this brand. So it gives us a chance to get all that stuff updated. So, yeah, there is a uh, there are fees involved, which go to also outreach. So... It's not just to you know enrich a company. It's to also get the word out. And our marketing outlet is to architects, designers, and builders. You know, the people that feed the integrators. So that's where we get the word out. We do we do one-on-one -on -one marketing, uh, meaning that we send um, we work with the integrator, find out the architects, designers, and builders that they work with will go out on their behalf and send emails to them, letting them know, hey, such and such integrator just met this, is HTA certified, this is a big accomplishment, here's what it means, and here's what the HTA is, it's a filter for you to use and weed out, you know, to, to narrow down your bidding list, because I gotta tell you, I have a lot of, I know, literally hundreds of architects, designers, and builders from you know, the Southern California market from my many, many years of doing outreach, they want something like this. They're looking for a filter to get you know, the, the client's cousin who does AV 
off the project because they're like, oh God, I've, <laughs> I've been here. I Oh geez, you know, whenever these kind of companies come in, it's usually a nightmare. I worked with you, Mr. Good Integrator, but now the client is bringing in their friend's friend and I, I don't want this. This is now that tool to say, hey, I only work with HTA certified firms and it's defensible. And by the way, that's already happening here in Southern California, our initial launch market. It's already working. Yep. Which is great. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, so you you launched in Southern California. What other markets are you currently working in? So the, now, yeah. So we launched. So we launched in, in the August 30th. So the initial launch market was uh, Southern California. That's where we kind of tested and calibrated everything. Once we launched uh, the website, you could say the website's open for business. So I have applica- I have 40. Ooh, just about 50 applications in play right now, all peppered throughout the U.S. So I don't have them in all 50 states yet, but um, New York, uh, we just posted two today in New York that met certification. Two more in Southern California did. Um, some in Connecticut are about to. So in, in Texas, uh, Utah, Colorado, Seattle, you know, they're, they're, they're peppered throughout the country. So um all over the the market now. I mean, all over the Very good. yeah, all over the all States. over the U.S. Yep. And we're going to expand internationally, but in, in 2018. Okay, excellent. That's good to hear. Um, how well you you kind of mentioned how this has been received by architects. How how has this been uh, received by uh, industry manufacturers? I, I know you mentioned that they want this uh, type of vetting. I mean, look at your your board of uh, advisors there. It's it's just about I, there's. Is like the who's who of uh yeah. of uh of the Cedia crowd and on your board of advisors. So, um, how how are they receiving this? They they love it. Um, th- this was this is why we really knew we were onto something good. So back in 2016, when the idea was germinated, we didn't even have a company name yet, just the concept, and going out and at, reaching out to these folks and saying, hey, this is this idea we have of creating the certification. What do you think? You know, kind of just doing a trial there. What do you think? Is this a good idea? This is great. As far as no one's done it yet. Well, would you help us? Yes. So we got all these people helped out, which is great. And and the reason why is, you know, these manufacturers, especially control systems, you know, the techie, the stuff that's really technologically complex, like control systems and lighting systems and some of the higher end uh, home theater systems, we get into heavy calibration and things. Um, these brands know that they live and die by the quality of installation and they do their own metrics when a companies do great and they get re- tons of referrals from some in- integrators and then the other ones that are having to you know get involved and step in and do takeover projects right so they live it and they do their own metrics and they've shared that with us you know here's what we see the commonalities of the good firms are and here's where we see commonalities of fa- that firms that fail so not only do they help us create the standard they- they've been very very helpful and in- create you know the ones that we reached out to and help crafting the standard. Um, they've even gone so far as to uh, invite their um, their top dealers to uh, to apply for certification. And the the three big control brands, uh, Control Four and Crestron and Savant, have all agreed to put HTA certified logos on their dealer finders. So that's a oh wow yeah that's a big thing. <laughs> it's a really yeah. big thing. Um, that's the good news. The 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 only bummer news right now is all three of those companies um, they haven't listed them yet because they're you know they're going through some updates on their website. So when they're right. you know all websites seem to be in a constant state of flux these days, but <laughs> <laughs> including ours. Yep. Um, but yeah, you'll see them on there soon, and it, it, th- that's a big win. And in other words, they see the value to the consumer that if a company is vetted and checked, that's just kind of like another way to say, you know kind of in a roundabout way, we endorse this company as well. Um, or why else would they be listing our logo on their site? So they want to um, differentiate their their HTA certified integrators as well. So that's a big thing. Integrate, or, or the manufacturers have been really behind us. Um, I've really enjoyed this thus far, reaching out to so many manufacturers and everyone has been you know, kind of putting wind in our sails and, and how can I help, you know, and I say what I want to do when I reach out and they ask that, I say, yeah, help me, you know, I'm, I'm opening up your market now. And can you please help me uh, identify the, the, the best firms in your market? 
Right. So they're they're giving me lists of oh, the people cool. that are yeah that that they say I think these companies are going to make it. They do a great job. They're you know I whenever I have a takeover project, these are the guys that get it done, and you know so it's great to to find out. Um, all this intelligence, and I got to say, it's great meeting a lot of integrators throughout the country. There's some. This is a good industry. There's a lot of nice people out there, and a lot of companies that really, really sweat the details and really take care of clients. And hey, now they have a tool. Now they have a tool to right. legitimately disqualify the the uh, the unqualified firms and get them out of the process. And then we all win <laughs> when that happens. And that's what we were talking about a little bit here before the show started, uh, before before we started recording, was that, um, you know, our show is, is primarily, uh, well, I mean, we started this a couple of years back, and we were looking at the landscape and, and kind of the future, like, where are we going to be five, 10 years from now? And we saw all these consumer-grade products coming on board. I mean, we, we at the time, I think we only had Nest laying around, and Jason and I were just sitting there talking, like, this is, this is going to get huge. Little did we know, a couple, a couple of uh, months later, Nest would be bought by Google for $3 billion. Like <laughs> we, we had no idea what the craziness that was going to happen over the, 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 the following few years. And now we're looking at down the barrel of the gun, you know, the gaffa gun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. To, to use a, a term, but like we we've been talking about gaffa, it seems um, for most of this year. And um, it, this seems like it's a pretty good uh, tool for dealers out there to, you know, get certified and kind of distinguish themselves from the what's going to be an influx of maybe the Amazon home services people who come out and pop in a, a Nest camera or in a in a door lock or and not even a Nest camera now an Amazon camera and a door lock. Like this seems like it'd be a pretty good tool for an integrator to say, you know, put their stake in the ground and, and put their tin up and say, this is the market I want to serve and this is I want to serve this extremely well. Let Gaffa do their thing, and I'll hang out right here. This this seems like uh, for the up market for for where you know the projects that you, you and I are probably familiar with. This seems like it's a, a great certification to have. Exactly, exactly. It's a great differentiator. And and I, I in other comments that we've got back, and I I urge everyone listening to check out the website. You don't, you don't have to to poke around long and read the articles for very long to realize it's great consumer facing information. Um, it, it's it's what a good integrator would, would want their clients to read before they even had their first client meeting. And, and this will help them. This will kind of help them. And so I, I, we don't mention GAFA in our website per se, but you know we, we're mentioning the importance of technology in our everyday lives and having it be reliable and having it by put in someone that's responsive to service and understands technology, knows how to design and engineer it. And these are, and we even tell, we even uh, tell them uh, some of the questions to ask and some of the statistics to look for in a dealer's profile, which will help the, the client to see, is this, this company a good fit for me? And you're right. Um, this is what a good integrator wants. You know, they, they're good integrators are more than happy to sign up because it's, it's like a way to say, yes, I'm good. And here I am. And this will be interesting to see, especially in this GAFA thing with, Hey, this is going to be really interesting to watch how this is going to evolve, right? With the with them doing this home technology services, and what's that going to look like? You know, what what mm-hmm. level of service and, and expertise is is going to happen to that? Do, do those people? That does Amazon have guys doing uh, you know D-tools, drawings, and CAD and, and engineering documents and leaving them behind on the home? You know, don't think so. <laughs> so no, I, I don't think they're going to come close to doing that anytime soon. Right, right. And, and it'll be interesting to see how that goes because you know can, customers these days are more demanding of customer service than ever. And um, it's you know one thing to return a product with you know Amazon Prime. You know you could just return it in the mail, kind of convenient. But what happens when they expect that with their technology experiences? I, I, it's just it's just a weird world right now. So right. yeah, it's definitely a good way to differentiate yourselves and say, hey, we're we're a good established company. We've proven this track records. And here's a reason why you want to hire us. Right. Well, Josh, I, I want to thank you for coming on the show tonight. Uh, we're running a little bit uh, close here on our time, uh, but I do want to ask, what, what's next for the HTA? What What are you guys looking at? Uh, what's the big What's the next milestone that you guys are looking at? So what we're our goals right now are to you know flesh out bit of the country. I could tell you now we've got applications coming in all throughout the United States, um, which has been a great bit of outreach. And matter of fact, it came, I think one of the first bits of information came on, on your hub channel, the Slack channel, 
um, Jason reached out to me and said, Hey, we got some people and you know, other, we, we got listeners all over the world that listen to us. And we got people that are wondering to know if you're going to move internationally. So we got interest from England, interest from Australia, Canada. I already have names of integrators that are ready to sign up when we're ready to go there. So we want to, yeah, you, know, you build up the U.S. a bit more, you know, dot the I's, cross the T's. I'm sure there's a couple little bugaboos we're going to have to fix on our website, I'm sure. But once we get all that figured out, then we're going to move internationally. So 2018 is going to see that happen, um, move internationally. And the other thing we want to do, too, is, you know, manufacturers are, um, since we have a consumer-facing site, some manufacturers are wanting to sponsor or advertise, however you want to put it, on our site. So we may open our site up to that as well so they could get their brands in front of consumers. So that's where we look to, to, to go um, for the you know, foreseeable future. And also, one other thing, too, is um, most integrators don't do alarm. And uh, we may be opening up our site, not that we're certifying alarm companies, because that's not what we're about, or integration, you know, we certify integrators. But we, one of the things that's on our map, too, is to go out and find the alarm companies in the various markets that work with our integrators, you know, that understand control systems and smart home, and that get it. And then we'll all be able to kind of, let's say, fill in the missing service sometimes. So a client could come to our site and, you know, maybe round out that technology experience. But that's, that's just a thought. That's not anything etched in stone yet. But that's something that we're thinking of including as well. You know, some of the ancillary companies that serve the integrators, like alarm companies, like uh, theater consultants, acoustic consultants, um, companies like that. Right, right. Well, very good, very good. Um, how can uh, I know we've we talked about the website, but I don't think we've ever mentioned the exact address of the website. Uh, how can listeners find out more and connect with you and, and learn more in general? Sure. Uh, the website URL is htacertified.org. And so, yeah, it's all there. It's a, it's a very simple to navigate site. You'll see right on the home page, there's a link to that budget calculator, um, a link to find, you know, to kind of peruse the listings of certified integrators. And um, I urge, too, to look through, you know, see who the board of directors is. There's a who link up there, a great FAQ. And on that home page, if you scroll to the footer or kind of mid middle of the home page, you'll see get certified links. So any integrators that are interested in applying, just go there, click on it. And um, it's, it's an easy thing to start. And again, no money transacts until, you know, after the application is done and assuming it meets the preliminary um, approval. So... Um, you know, nothing's at risk to apply. And um, yeah, I'd urge them to check it out. Excellent. Well, Josh, thanks so much for your time coming on the show and, and letting us know about uh, HTA and what you guys are trying to do. Uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. And thanks for having me on, Seth. And Jason, hope you feel better soon. Absolutely. Have a good one. You too.